Well, it's 1 o'clock. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for being here. It's a beautiful day. I know. It? Yeah. Um, no rain. <laughs> That's true. A little chilly. It's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. Yeah. The heat going this way. So, is this the first time you guys have ever been to the Chinese Garden? I've been a member since the day. I've been oh, a volunteer. Really? I've been to a million of these talks. Oh, really? And how about you? Have you been to some of I've been here last I've been here almost once or twice a year. Uh-huh. So you've been to some of the talks. I've been to some of the talks. Oh, okay. Sure. Great. Just All right. The garden. <laughs> okay, good. Well, we have some tea that is coming your way. Good. To help warm you up. Group, so. Oh, okay. what is it? Um, this is, well, I'll, we'll talk about it kind of towards the end, but it's, it's a two, uh, two Chinese herbs, um, astragalus and red date. Oh, I take astragalus a lot. I mean, I oh. used to take astragalus a lot. Yeah. yeah. I can taste it. I can taste the astragalus. Uh-huh. Doesn't it smell good? That, um, uh, what do you call it? Peas. What kind of, um, what's the name of that group? Lagoon. Isn't it a lagoon? Astragalus. Uh, astragalus? Is, yeah. I think it's a lagoon, like peas and everything. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks and for coming you? today. I am Andrea Peruzzi. Um, I'm a licensed acupuncturist here in Portland. I'm a Chinese medicine practitioner. I graduated from OCOM, and now I practice at OCOM, actually. I practice mm -hmm. at the Chinatown location, and I also practice out um, at Southeast oh, Cherry Blossom Drive. So, hi, come hi. on in. Oh, you're just looking. What, what are you guys doing? Teaching? Oh. All right. Good job. Yeah. So today's topic is family health, stress reduction, and mindfulness. Um, and so with that, stress reduction and mindfulness, before we even begin anything at all, I just want to take a minute to leave all of our cares at the door and do just a moment of breath work. So what we're going to start by doing, and you might want to put your tea down, is start with abdominal breathing. And that means we're going to start the bones on our belly button and put your hands together, like kind of like a triangle, um, feet on the ground. And we're going to do this 10 times. Um, we're going to breathe in through our nose and fill up our abdomen with the air. And then breathe out through our mouth. As we... Exhale, hold the air, and I'll kind of let you guys just do that on your own. Again, breathe in through your nose and fill up your abdomen, and out through your mouth, contracting your abdomen. I'll take my jacket off for you guys to do that about five more times. chest and do uh, take a minute to do some chest breathing so hands on our chest same idea breathing air in through your nose and filling up your chest this time reduction I um, I was kind of I had a whole bunch of things that I kind of wanted to somehow bring together and I didn't know where to start so 
So where I'd like to start today is um, with a passage from the classic The Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine. Has anyone heard of this? Yes, many Before times. Many I think to all her class, what's her name, Liz? Liz? Beth? Beth, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in so many of her classes. Yeah. So the, the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Medicine um, is kind of where a lot of people start their Chinese medicine education. Um, this is a text that is a Chinese medicine classic. It's also a Taoist text. Um, it talks about the natural laws of the universe, disease pre prevention, um, identification of disease, and how to treat disease. Um, and it's written sort of as a dialogue between the Yellow Emperor, who reigned during the third millennium BCE, and his ministers. Um, the very first chapter of this book is called The Universal Truth. And this is a great place to start when thinking about mindfulness. So I'll just read uh, a moment for you. Um, so Huang Chi asks, uh, Hong Di asks Chi Bo, um, he says, I've heard that in the days of old, everyone lived 100 years without showing the usual sign of aging. In our time, however, people age prematurely, living only 50 years. He goes on to ask why is this? Chibo replied, in the past, people practiced the Tao, the way of life. They understood the principle of balance, of yin and yang, as represented by the transformation of the energies of the universe. Thus, they formulated practices such as Yin, an exercise combining stretching, massage, and breathing to promote energy flow, and meditation to help maintain and harmonize themselves with the universe. They ate a balanced diet at regular times, arose and retired at regular hours, avoided overstressing their bodies and minds, and refrained from overindulgence of all kinds. These days, <laughs> people have changed their way of life. They drink wine as though it were water, indulge excessively in destructive activities. <clears throat> they do not know the secret of conserving their energy and vitality. So it is not surprising that they look old at 50 and die soon after. Okay. <clears throat> so and that was 5,000 years ago, right? It was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So same thing. So same, same old, same old. Yeah. Um, so what they're talking about within the aging are these ideas of exercise, <laughs> stretching, massage, breathing, meditation. This idea of a balanced diet, eating at regular times, <clears throat> refraining from overindulgences. And then he's also talking about um, the basics of a nourishing diet. Um, okay, so also in thinking about um, where I wanted to go with this lecture, I was reminded of a book that I read when I was a, a, first a student um, at Oklahoma. Um, and in this book, written by Bob Claude, um, he talks about Emperor Qianlong. Emperor Qianlong lived from 1711 to 1799. There he, there he is. <laughs> Can't really see his face. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard of Emperor Qianlong? Um, so Emperor Qianlong was the fourth of the Qing emperors of China. He reigned for 16, uh, uh, excuse me, about 60 years from, 19, uh, from 1735 until 1796. He actually uh, really had control until he died in um, 1799. He, he, he passed on power to his son, I believe, so he wouldn't reign longer than his grandfather, uh, but, he, but he actually did kind of maintain power until he died. And he's unique because most of the emperors that, that um, were through the Ming Dynasty and through the Qing Dynasty, which is a period of about oh, 500 years or so, um, reigned for only an average of about 19 years, and he, <coughs> he reigned about 60 years, um, living into his 80s. Uh, most emperors of that time died in their prime, um, and uh -huh. that's in part, maybe, because they 
Um, they were the emperor, and they could do whatever they wanted. They could eat whatever they wanted. Um, they didn't really have to exercise, and they probably overindulged. And um, so that's part of the reason why they probably didn't live so long. But Emperor Qianlong did live a long time, and he shares um, in this in this book written by Bob Floss um, some of his secrets to longevity. Um, so Emperor Qianlong says to rise early. Find a place with pure, fresh air, inhale deeply, and exhale the stale air. So what he's talking about, um, rising early, he's talking about sort of having a uh, rhythm to your day, a rhythm with which you get up. And then he's talking about some sort of like breath work or meditation or qigong um, as a way to start the day. Uh, he says, use herbs and special foods to, to restore the qi. So he's talking about herbal medicine, but he's also talking about um, using using food as medicine and, and maintaining a you know basic healthy diet. Um, and then he says things like click the teeth together, swallow the saliva, <clears throat> massage the ears, rub the nose. Um, if any of you have practiced um, qigong mm -hmm. or um, certain types of meditation, we, we do these things as a way of um, connect. Uh, waking, waking up the body um, and connecting, um, connecting to our internal organs. So, for instance, um, the nose is connected to our lungs, so we rub the nose as a way to connect <clears throat> with our lung chi. Um, and cooking the teeth together um, is a way to connect with your kidneys, um, and, and and of course, a way of strengthening your teeth at the same time, um, because there's a relationship there. Um, Emperor Qianlong also says, knead the feet, do not speak while eating, do not chat while lying down, do not drink in excess and roll the eyes. So um, here where we see it says, do not speak while eating and do not chat while lying down. He's, he's referring to, um, what we could say, he's referring to this idea of just kind of doing one thing at a time. Um, not multitasking like we all probably do. When I was when I was kind of rereading these things, I was like, oh gosh, like don't speak while eating, do not chat while lying down. Like uh, you just kind of think about all the ways that we multitask in our daily lives. At least I did anyway. Um, so I'm going to merge kind of uh, Chiamong's uh, healthy tips. <laughs> and those tips in the Neijing together in this talk today and um, relate them kind of to this idea of mindfulness, family health, and stress reduction. So the first concept that we can talk about is this keeping a regular lifestyle. Uh, Sun Sun Yao, who's a very famous Chinese physician from the, he lived through the, um, Sui and Tang Dynasty um, says, those who are good at health preservation vary their time of rising and going to bed in accordance with the supersession of the seasons and keep regular hours in daily life. In the Beijing, chapter two is called The Art of Life Through the Four Seasons. And um, and here's what it says. Um, here's, here's what it says in regards to um, following, the, following the flow of the seasons. So first Huangdi, the yellow emperor, starts with spring. And he tells us that <clears throat> the, the three months of spring season bring about the revitalization of all things in nature. It is the time of birth. This is when heaven and earth are reborn. During this season, it is advisable to retire early. Rise early also and go walking in order to absorb the fresh, invigorating energy. Since this is the season in which the universal energy begins anew and rejuvenates, one should attempt to correspond this directly by being open and unsuppressed. Uh, he also says that on a physical level, it's a good time to exercise more frequently and wear loose-fitting clothing. Do stretching exercises to loosen up the muscles and tendons. And 
um, he says we do all of, all of this in part to um, keep us healthy as we move into summer. During the three months of summer, Huang Di tells us that there's an abundance of sunshine and rain. As a result, the plants mature and the animals and flowers and fruit appear abundantly. He says that one may retire somewhat later this time of year, as many of us do in the summertime, while still rising early. One should refrain from anger and stay physically active. <clears throat> Emotionally, it is important to be happy and easygoing so that the energy can flow freely and communicate. This way, illness is averted in the fall. Um, so Huang Di talks about kind of the relationship between what you're doing in, in one season and how it helps you moving into the next season. Um, so then he talks about autumn, the month that we are currently in. Um, in the three months of autumn, all things in nature reach their full maturity, which we know the leaves have now withered, they've <coughs> fall, they've fallen, um, the grains ripen and harvesting occurs. The heavenly energy cools, as does the weather. <clears throat> One should retire at sunset and rise with the dawn. Just as the weather in autumn turns harsh, so too can our emotional climate. Therefore, it is important to remain calm and peaceful. And lastly, he talks about winter. He says, during the winter months, all, thing in all things in nature wither, hide, return home, and enter a resting period just as the lakes and rivers freeze and the snow fall. Therefore, one should refrain from overusing the yang energy. Retire early and get up with the sunrise, which is later in the winter. The philosophy of winter is one of conservation and storage. Um, so, Remaining mindful of the changes of the, of the season is, is very important. It takes, it takes the focus um, away from you know, the daily chaos of our lives and connects us to what's going on in our environment. Um, so just to reiterate, um, in springtime, when we um, recommend these things, exercising more frequently. Springtime is, is when the um, leaves are, the buds are beginning to come out, the grass is beginning to sprout up. This is a time when we're feeling more energized and we can use, use that energy to exercise more frequently and absorb the fresh, clean air that is spring. Uh, as he said, in summertime, um, the, uh, the, everything, everything, is, everything is kind of coming to its maturity. Um, it's a time when we can also be physically active. The sun is setting later, so we can retire later at night as well. And then fall, where we are right now, is a time when, we, when our energy starts to move inward. It's getting cold outside. We feel that in our body. We feel we're starting to kind of contract and hold ourselves a little, a little tighter. Um, and we should kind of move with that, with that in our daily lives. We feel like we want to go home and curl up and read a book and not maybe be as active. And that's really what autumn is all about. Um, in winter, we're in, we're in a period of storage. The animals around us go into hibernation. Um, the lakes freeze. So this is a time for us to stay, stay in, warm up avoid the cold. <clears throat> um, <coughs> yes, I think I already said this, but um, just to reiterate that understanding these principles and having an awareness with the seasonal cycles allows us to kind of be in rhythm with nature. Um, does that make sense or does anyone have any specific questions about that? Or? Okay. Um, and then I just want to mention um, and I, this, this concept of keeping regular hours, um, which of course as we have now learned transition a little bit during the seasons, um, but from day to day, um, we say in Chinese medicine that yang qi begins to grow when the sun rises. And we know that at um, noon, that's when the sun is, at, at midday, that's when the sun is the strongest. 
in our bodies. This is, you know, we're waking midday when the sun is the strongest. We also have the most <clears throat> uh, most energy, and then this begins to increase at sunset. So this is the just the, you know, you probably already have a sense and understanding of this in life, but this daily cycle um, should be followed by by humans as well. So, healthy surroundings. Um, some of this, um, I mean, it's probably, you know, you have a good idea about, but um, I wanted to bring it up just because um, living a healthy life, sometimes we think we need to do all, all these things, um, but so much of it just starts at home and where you spend the majority of your time. And so that should be a place with proper ventilation, with fresh air, that's free from you know toxins and chemicals, a place that has access to sunshine and a place that has limited pollution. Your home is a place where you go to replenish your energy, so it should be um, warm and have fresh air. And, and your bedroom is truly the place where you go to replenish your energy. That should be a peaceful place to sleep. Um, and. And it should be free from too many electrical devices, which is, you know, something I've been thinking about in my life. My husband just um, decided to move our laptop into our bedroom uh, desk, and I wasn't so happy about that. Maybe that's, yeah. Um, so just things to think about in your daily life. Um, yeah. Um, I want to talk to you guys about dietary mindfulness, because this is something that um, overlapped between uh, the Neijing and um, Qianlong ideas. Um, the eating environment is something that we don't often pay a lot of attention to, even if we, um, even if we think we do. Um, eating um, should be um, an enjoyable activity, but something that's done in a relaxed manner. Um, a lot of us spend our time eating in front of the TV or reading, and um, from a Chinese medicine perspective, um, we don't think that's the best idea. Um, and emotional discussions or eating when you're upset is also um, not good for, for your health from a Chinese medicine perspective. Uh, in keeping with, with this concept of like you're living your life in accordance with these daily rhythms, it's best to eat at a set time and a set place. And then chew your food, <laughs> which is something that can be quite hard to do, actually. I recently um, sat down by myself and had a meal and told myself I would you know, just chew everything 30, that 30 times. And that's, kind of, that's a difficult thing to do, actually. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to do that. Um, but you really taste the flavors in a way that maybe you're not paying attention to on a daily basis. Um, so Chinese medicine and the diet. Um, Chinese medicine, um, I'm sorry, I didn't ask. How many of you have gone to a Chinese medicine practitioner or, okay, and um, would that be for, if you don't mind sharing acupuncture or herbs or what did, what did you have done, acupuncture? Um. Well, uh, there used to be a Chinese medicine clinic on Petty Grove, uh -huh. and this was like 10, 12 years ago. Uh -huh. um, I had severe mercury poisoning from my dental work, and uh, so um, I got early stage cancer from it. Uh -huh. And uh, I was going for acupuncture and, um, with Dr. Long. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, and I've, and I've had, uh, oh, I've been to probably five different acupuncture the first time in like 1978. Oh, wow. My, my chiropractor took a class and I learned don't go to somebody who's just learning. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, he um, put a needle in to, he caused too many toxins to leave at one time and I got oh. severe headaches. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the reason I asked if any of you have experienced Chinese medicine is for a lot of people, they they think uh, acupuncture and or they think Chinese herbs and um, Chinese medicine encompasses 
um, has a few different branches. One is acupuncture, one is herbal medicine, another is massage, um, and another is dietary therapy. And then we also have um, uh, ex uh, additional modalities like cupping, you may be using um, gua sha is another. Um, but anyway, so people don't necessarily realize that Chinese medicine has a branch of <coughs> dietary therapy. Um, and it's specific to the individual. If you, if you see a Chinese medicine practitioner and are interested in Chinese medicine diet therapy, um, that's a very individualized uh, thing. But we can, we can kind of introduce the, the general themes and concepts that run through Chinese medicine in regards to diet. So um, uh, Chinese medicine, for the most part, um, recommends a clear and light diet. That light meaning kind of bland foods. And bland not meaning like boring bland, but just um, a moderate diet. Moderate, not too spicy, not too, um, you know, fatty, not too, um, that's what they mean by bland. So this is mostly a diet of grains and veggies, some fruits and beans, and then um, meats, yes, <laughs> but um, not necessarily in the large amount that some some people consume meats, um, and then minimal amounts of fats and pungent spices. And these guidelines vary throughout the year and vary from individual to individual. Um, and so um, Chinese medicine said, you know, because we have to, um, our stomach has to warm up our food to be able to digest it. So Chinese medicine um, typically prefers that raw foods be eaten in only small amounts and that we cook or at least lightly steam or boil our foods. Um, and then just in terms of being mindful of dietary habits, um, a rule of thumb is to stop eating when food tastes best, which is so hard to do. <laughs> um, I think, you know, in our society these days, there really isn't a lot of mindfulness regarding eating because so many of us eat in a hurry or we're not able to all eat as a family or we're, like I said before, watching TV when we eat or something like this. So I just wanted to add um, <coughs> these tips to aid in digestion as a way for you guys to be more mindful uh, of the eating process. Um, so after you eat, you can just practice some um, abdominal rubbing, and um, that means you'll always just warm your hands up, and then you'll place your hands on your abdomen and rub in large circles from um, right to left, in the direction that's the direction of your large your large intestine. And after you do that 20 or 30 times, you'll just go ahead and repeat in the other direction. And for people who are prone to constipation, they can just um, do that first part, moving from right to left, um, because that's the pathway of your large intestine here. Um, and then it's recommended uh, that people take short walks um, after meals to aid in their digestion. There's a famous Chinese saying, walk 100 paces after meals and one can live 99 years. So does that rhyme? No. <laughs> it almost sounded like it did. <laughs> It'll be better if it did. Um, yeah, walk well, 100 paces after meals and one can live 99 years. So, okay, nutrition and our life cycle. Um, children, from a Chinese medicine perspective, um, we think that they're. Um, hey! <laughs> did you get some tea? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. I just had lunch, so I'm. Oh, okay. Very good, yum. All right. Oh, okay. So, did, did you just get that part? Yeah, I'm novel? just ready oh, to do this. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect timing. Um, so, from a Chinese medicine perspective, we uh, consider children and their digestion to not fully be, um, to not fully be, I guess we could say mature. It's not strong. It's um, still, still becoming strong. So, for children, um, it's very important to introduce proper eating habits early with a focus on strengthening their digestion. And how do you do that? Um, 
Again, that varies, of course, from individual to individual. But as a general rule of thumb, this means um, eating neutral to mildly warming foods um, of a sweet flavor. Um, sweet strengthens your um, digestive power. But when I say sweet, I don't mean sweet. I mean, I don't mean what we think of as sweet, what kids would think of as sweet, like cookies and chocolate or that sounds good. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, traditionally, the sweet flavor refers to things like grains. Um, and, and it can refer to um, a little bit of natural sweeteners, like honey or maple syrup, but really that sweet flavor is kind of referring to grains. Um, so I just included a few examples of great foods for, to strengthen kids' digestion. Um, that being millet, rice, carrots, um, apple, honey, raisins. Um, I put fennel tea down. That's a great thing to drink any, for any of you to aid in your digestive process. Um, so through midlife, an emphasis that you can begin to kind of think of to have dietary awareness um, would just be eating more for your constitution. And that's something that a Chinese medicine um, practitioner can um, can guide you with. And actually, I'll, I have this, this is an awesome book, um, Chinese Nutritional Therapy. I'll hand it around if you guys want to take a look. Um, there are examples in the back of um, different foods. And from a Chinese medicine perspective, we say that foods have like a thermal nature. Um, so when you say, um, you know, from, if I were to say that something is warm from a Chinese medicine perspective, I don't just mean that I cooked it and it's warm. I mean that it has like an inherently warm quality to that. So if you're curious about like what, um, what I mean by that, there's a little um, index here in the back that just talks about, uh, it's alphabetically ordered. Um, it has pretty much everything you could think of and it just talks about it. Um, what they do in the body and what its thermal nature is. Maybe I'll just give it to you and you can pass it around if you want to take a little look. I'm curious that um, there's no mention of things like tofu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mention tofu. Um, but that's just, you know, because I didn't think to mention it. Uh -huh. um, we consume a, a large amount of tofu, and of course, Asian cultures eat tofu as well. Um, tofu is cold um, in nature, so it um, can be a little hard for some people to digest because mm -hmm. it's so cold. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we well, can look it up in, in the uh -huh. back. And, um, yeah, you know, I don't even think about tofu because I don't, I don't digest it very well, so mm -hmm. it, <laughs> mm -hmm. it doesn't come up for me. Um, <clears throat> I'm vegan, so I, it would be a, a, an important statement. Uh -huh. I also want to mention, and I don't know if you will, but um, you, know, you asked if a person had experience with um, Chinese medicine. Yeah. I, I personally haven't, even though I've read quite a bit about it, but we do practice it with our pets. Oh. And they're an important part of our family. Like you take them to acupuncture? They get acupuncture, and they have, acupuncture. Acupuncture, <laughs> and they have a different form of acupuncture, I call it the tuning fork one for our 20 year old cat. Uh -huh. And then for our poodles, they get the, the little needle, acupuncture needle. Oh. And they all. Do they sit still? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They love they it. They know who sits our, still? Our dog had it this morning, our little poodle had it this morning because she gets arthritis really badly. And um, she falls asleep in my arms when she has it. But what do you that is the vet? Does a vet do it? Yes. I wonder if she has a problem with the animals sitting still, because they, they can't move around, right? You know, I've heard that time and time again. I've never seen animals get acupuncture, but I've heard lots of people say they just like relax and yeah. are totally fine. In fact, so. our, our, our one poodle it gets, it has learned to relax so much that when I put drops in her eyes now, away from the acupuncturist, she'll actually put her head back and, and go to sleep in my arms. All I do is rub the top of her forehead. And she'll actually, she's, it's like she's learned how to relax. Oh, I can totally believe it. I mean, and yeah. for a cat, you know, you think a cat wouldn't sit still for this. Uh -huh. A 20-year-old cat, she'll growl and everything like that. And then when she starts getting 
I don't know what it's called, it's like the tuning fork. Uh -huh. you know? She just, it, it relieves her of so much pain, it's incredible. Aww. Do they get oil? No, we can put oil on the joints too, like castor oil. Yeah, no, but um, we do have herbs that we give them. Because castor oil is great for, mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Because mm -hmm. I, I have um, torn muscles and uh, hip joint problem, and castor oil is fabulous. To so just rub on? Yeah, oh, I'll try that. It's very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For people too. <laughs> I'm looking at this and they are not mentioning fish at all. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, it's fish is fish is recommended. Yeah. Um, I didn't I didn't necessarily intentionally leave it out. I just um, listed just a few uh, like a few general tips. Um, but fish is fish is absolutely recommended. I think I saw your husband looking, like looking in the window by the way. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> becoming that bad. I don't know. I think so. Um, yeah. So you can look in this book and kind of get an idea. Um, I, I find it, it because I'm just visiting and I didn't even know you were having this lecture. And I said, oh, oh I'm going to go to the, it's like, I'm just going to go and wander. And so <laughs> it's like. It, this is interesting because I changed my diet um, about, I'm going to say eight years ago. Uh huh. Um, for the better. And it, it's amazing the difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, just so amazing. But mine tends to be more. I mean, there's a lot of Asian influence in it, but there's an awful lot of, I'm going to say, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, African. Yeah. Um, which is a lot of the same <laughs> kind of foods. And it's, you know, people will freak out and they'll say, what are you eating now? Yeah. You know. Well, from a Chinese medicine perspective, um, you know, there are basic guidelines that we have regarding diet, but really it all comes down to the individual and just like figuring out. Um, we, Chinese medicine uses food as medicine. Um, well, and the, what's so interesting <laughs> as far as the dairy, I don't typically eat dairy at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And our son basically doesn't consume dairy. Mm -hmm. And and I I mean he he went from human to cow milk for a year and a half and then stopped. Dairy. And people say, Yeah, we eat dairy. Well, I'll have cheese, but no, no dairy. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no need for it. Yeah. Yeah. Some people some people do well with with dairy. Um, Chinese medicine kind of takes like a moderation in every uh, you know, moderation in all things kind of approach. And so um, for the most part we say to like limit dairy, um, especially this season, especially. It's autumn, it's getting cold out, we're all becoming prone to these like phlegmy kind of coughs, and so um, in eating with the seasons, that would be something that we would definitely want to stay away from in autumn. So, let me see, did I talk about everything here? I think I touched on everything. Um, I was just going to mention that um, with elderly people, you know, digestion is a little weaker, so um, their schedule might need to be adapted and eat smaller meals throughout the day. Um, and so, like we were just talking about, um, it's autumn, um, and autumn is a time when energy gathers on the inside of the body, and because it's cold outside and energy is gathering, we can think about adding a moderate amount of like acrid, pungent type foods to um, to our diet, things like ginger or something like that, because that sort of moderates this cold contracting um, idea of what that is autumn. Um, so things, I didn't put ginger there, and I don't know why, because that would definitely be um, important, but, and things like radishes that have this like pungent quality. Um, and then avoiding, you know, so there are a lot of people that love raw food in Portland, and that's great. Um, but in this time of year, when things are cooling down so much, um, it's important to think about eating warming foods to help your digestion. Um, it seems like it's right. I'm just I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. I'm looking 
carrots and we had lobster with, with corn the night before and it's just like an oatmeal yeah. every morning and it's just like... Well that's great. Yeah. The, the topic, which I don't know if you knew what the topic of today's talk was, which is um, family medicine, mindfulness and stress reduction. So from my perspective, a lot of it has to do with like understanding how to eat and live in accordance with like uh, with nature. And it sounds like you're doing a good job of that. Um, and we're moving into winter. I don't know if you, I don't know when winter starts, maybe towards the end of December 20th or so. Um, but the body is susceptible to cold during the winter um, for obvious reasons. Um, this is the time of, the end of winter is the best time of year to build up um, your energy, build up your blood, nourish your body, basically. And so you can think about eating more um, like highly nourishing <coughs> foods in moderation to so things like um, lamb and duck and stews that are just very, very nourishing to the body. And then um, the last thing that I just want to talk about with you guys today are, um, you know, in, in the Neijing and Qianlong mentioned um, herbal, herbal medicines and using, um, using um, herbs for health. And that's not necessarily practical for a lot of us in our daily lives at home. So I just wanted to touch on the idea of medicinal teas for family health and wellness. Um, medicinal teas are an excellent choice um, when a full herbal pharmacy is unavailable. I have this great book here today, Chinese Medicinal Teas. Um, and I borrowed one of the recipes in here to make this little tea that we've been drinking. Um, and from a Chinese medicine health perspective, we say that um, drinking these medicinal teas um, can can help you if you're following like a particular Chinese medicine diet as well. They work hand in hand. Um, do you guys want to take a little? Do you want to take a little look at this Chinese tea book? Um, this is great. It's kind of organized in terms of like parts of the body, like your respiratory system, digestive system. And, uh, so I just picked two really easy little teas to share with Hi. Hi there. <laughs> to share with you guys today. Was that you that I saw peeking in? Back no. Then? Oh, was it? <laughs> okay, well, I have a good one. Yeah, I found it on the wall. <laughs> Somebody was wondering what was going on. Um, so today we're drinking an astragalus and red date tea. Um, those are both Chinese herbs. Huang Chi is astragalus and uh, Zhao Zhao is red date. Um, so Huang Qi is the first, the first herb in there. Um, we say, um, kind of like I was talking about regarding food, having a thermal nature, we say that herbs also have a thermal nature. And so Huang Qi's um, nature is um, slightly warm and it's a sweet herb. And I mentioned that sweet kind of uh, works on your digestive system. It strengthens your digestive system. So this is one of the functions of astragalus. Uh, we say that it kind of goes to our lung and spleen organs and tonifies the chi, tonifies the energy in our body, tonifies our blood, strengthens our digestion. And um, in Chinese medicine, we use this term stabilize the exterior. Uh, that means um, help um, your help prevent the things like the common cold or help prevent illness from attacking your body. Um, and Huang Chi also has the ability to reduce edema in the body. And maybe you guys, do you guys want to try some tea? We have some tea <laughs> that I'm talking about right now. Hello. Um, so the second ingredient in this tea is Zhao Zhao, Chinese red date. And this herb also has a warm thermal nature, and it's also sweet, and it goes right to our digestive, our digestive system. It goes to our spleen and our stomach and tonifies our digestion and nourishes our blood. In Chinese medicine, um, uh, red colors, so like Chinese red date, um, these kinds of herbs help to nourish our blood. Um, <clears throat> and red dates are sweet, nourishing, and moistening. So to prepare this tea, you can um, 
you can use three parts of the astragalus to one part of the red beet, and you boil, in water, boil it in water for 30 minutes, and then you drink it. Um, this is a strengthening tea when you, when you drink it often. This will prevent you from um, getting things like the common cold and keep, keep your body strong. Um, and it also um, strengthens our digestion. So it fortifies our digestion, it nourishes our blood, keeps our exterior healthy. And that, sorry, there's a little error there. Um, through fall and winter. And it's lovely. It's a lovely one to drink. Um, astragalus you can find um, at various help at various places around town, like the herb shop on Hawthorne, and I don't know if you can just go into Ocom over there and get a. I'm not really sure if you can just buy it there or if you need it prescribed. Um, but there's a lot of places where you can buy a stragglers. Um And then the last little tea that I'll just mention, and we don't have any samples of it today, but um, this is a cough and sore throat tea. So good to think about right now during this time of year. Hopefully none of us have had that happen yet, but it's very <coughs> simple. The ingredients are licorice root and field mint or peppermint. Um, again, licorice root you can get over at like, the herb shop on Hawthorne or um, I'm not sure where, where else, um, any, any herb type store. Um, and then if you can't find field mint, which I know we have over at Ocom, um, you can use peppermint in it. It's a three to one ratio. And then you can add a pinch of white sugar, just, or not. I think you can get them in new seasons as yeah. well. Yeah. Liver root? Yeah. 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 Oh, There's a mixture really? for the throat. In fact, I've got oh, a right. coat. It's called throat coat. It's oh, got yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, mean, I, I, I like this setup here, so I. I buy the liquor shoot and I do get it in seasons as like just in, in like bulk you can buy it there or oh, yeah. I didn't even know. Cool. Okay, so so anyway, um, like I said, this is three to one ratio, more licorice. Um, and you just put the liquor shroot in two to three cups of water and boil it for about ten minutes, and then you want to add the mint at the end um, to kind of maintain its aromatic properties. If you boil it the whole time, that will be gone. Um, and you can just add a little bit of sugar for sweetness. Um, so licorice root is a Chinese herb. It's called Bang Sao. Um, from a Chinese medicine perspective, we say that it moistens the lungs and stops cough. And it also clears heat and relieves toxicity. Uh, it has some other functions in the body as well, but I'm just relating it to this tea. Um, and then boha is field mint. Boha um, acts on... Uh, our head, our eyes, our nose, our throat. So uh, we say that it disperses wind heat in the body. That's when you get a cold that is a heat type cold. So you're having sputum that's more yellow. You're having like a really sore throat. Um, in Chinese medicine, we, we say that um, you can have a wind heat type of cold or you can have a wind, wind cold type of cold. Um, the heat. So I'm talking about when you have more heat symptoms, like the red, sore throat, swollen tonsils, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so it's an indicated for a heat type of sore throat, itchy, painful, that kind of thing. So I'm sad that you guys came in kind of towards the end, but to wrap it all together, um, what we were talking about today was um, family health, mindfulness, and stress reduction. We came at that from a perspective of um, understanding how to maintain a regular um, lifestyle in accordance with the four seasons, um, how to create a healthy environment um, in your home, understanding proper nutrition for you and your family, um, and thinking about that in terms of the four seasons as well. And then we talked about those teas briefly. So I'd love to answer any questions if you have any. And otherwise, it was just very nice talking to all of you. Yeah. I have one quick question. Yeah. Since I'm a latecomer, <laughs> uh, the mention of sugar is that traditionally in Chinese? Yeah. No. Uh, culture, is not necessarily. Yeah, it's you'll, not. You'll drink it if you put sugar in it kind of thing? Or? Well, <laughs> actually, the only reason I put it in is because I took it directly from this Chinese medicinal tea book. Okay. 
Um, I don't know why they added a pinch of white sugar to the recipe, but I didn't want to copy it down in, you know, inappropriately. But I would say do without the white sugar. Mm -hmm. I don't know why why they decided to put that in there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's just a pinch, eh? Just a pinch. Just a pinch. Just a pinch. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. So as I'm looking at this, because the, you know, like I said with the cooking, um, because we do drink teas at the house, mm -hmm. but we use an awful lot of herbs. Mm -hmm. So when I prepare things like the other evening when I had the lamb, it was rubbed with mint mm -hmm. and garlic Ooh. and yummy fur <laughs> and a little bit of olive oil and cook quickly and not a lot of meat. But the the thing is, is that as far as where you're showing these different herbs, uh -huh. just ingesting the whole versus a tea is do they see that there's a difference as far as doing it as a tea uh -huh. versus eating it as a whole piece of herb? Yeah. Well, a lot of herbs in Chinese medicine like are a little different than the food grade versions. So for instance, like we use cinnamon in Chinese medicine, but it's not the same as the cinnamon you get. Um, you know, that you put in your oatmeal, it's a little bit different. So I so, only use a stick and I'll make a tea and then make the oatmeal out of the cinnamon mm -hmm, tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, your question is, is, is it different between when you cook something or distribute it as a tea? Right. When you're making a tea out of it, you're making a more like concentrated form of the herbs okay. and you're also using certain ratios to have a certain desired effect. Okay. So like for that, for that tea that we've been drinking, the Huangxi is, and the um, uh, the dots out are in a three to one ratio to have a specific um, kind of like synergistic effect. So it's a little different than when you just use it in your cooking and you're you know like oh a sprig of this you know a sprig of that. So the teas are more um, used in a medicinal manner. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Oh, thank yeah. you for coming. Yeah, and have more tea if you have the chance. <laughs> what about the last slide? This, oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. These are my resources and, um, <coughs> oh, I didn't even notice that that part was on there. I'm like, how did you know there was a last slide? <laughs> yeah, these are, um, you know, I put down the herb shop here for some resources for tea, different um, herbs for teas. Um, and I highly recommend this book that I passed around if you're interested in Chinese medicinal teas. Uh, and um, I just put the other books kind of that I read from the Yellow Emperor classic of Chinese medicine. Um, and uh -huh. so the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine has their tea shop there where you can buy. Um, well, are they prepared? We have an herbal medicinary. Um, and Usually you need a prescription um, from a practitioner there to obtain herbs, but I do think that they sell little, um, are, do you know if they're selling little like, yeah. maybe you can talk about that. Well, I can't really, oh. but um, they, I did, was reading the fire that we have about the gift packages, and uh -huh. they do have an herbal tea sampler. Yeah. So I'm assuming that they are, and I know that they've been talking recently about having more, um, Quick pickup things that you don't need a for. Yeah, yeah. I think we're trying to kind of like uh, make some things available more to the general public, so you can check check them out. Mm -hmm. A block the two way, and but yeah, I'm not totally sure about that. Mm -hmm. Where does a person purchase like the yellow one first? Oh, here. You know, gosh, they might even have it in, in the oh. gift shop here. Oh. Do they? Oh, I was thinking that um, oh, if you they, go to the dispensary, they do have it in the bookstore. Oh, they, so they do yeah. have it in the bookstore at Oklahoma, a couple blocks away. Have it this spring, so have um, it I, they don't have it here. I Otherwise, really they even have it at like uh, they have it at Pal. Pal's. They have yeah. it. I've seen it at Barnes and Noble before, actually. And C N M. Yep, and C N M, of course. Mm hmm Totally. Okay. Most you. bookstores. Yeah. This this is a great text. I really recommend mm -hmm. it. Do you want to take a look at it? I will read it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I think we can probably stop this thing. Sure. I don't know how to do it. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone, so Thank much. You. So yeah. And um, Oprah presents.